Uh, yeah? All right, great. Okay, so uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for coming to talk about P2PU. It's uh, P2PU Hacks Education. Uh, and I see this presentation as the first in a sort of series of talks uh, where people from P2PU go, go out into the world and basically explain what exactly P2PU does uh, and what uh, your role could be at P2PU. Uh, my name is Niels. Uh, I'm a, uh, like, I can, could call myself founding volunteer. Uh, and I was one of the original course organizers in 2009 uh, at the very start of P2PU. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give the stage to Paul, who was involved with the uh, very early creation of the uh, current platform, uh, Learnanta. Um, so, I don't know how many of you uh, know about P2PU. Like, could you hold hands? Like, who, uh, who knows about P2PU, knows what it is? All right, okay. So. Uh, it's good because I have a sort of uh, introdu short introduction about what, why P2PU is important and, and what it is exactly. Um, so we know that uh, uh, educational structures, as we now know it, uh, have some uh, problems which we recently have been seeing like pretty, uh, uh, pr pretty, pretty badly. Uh, so the uh, first one, like there's there's tons of them, but there's two most important ones. Uh, one is the uh, iron triangle of cost, quality, and access, which means that if you increase access, you're going to increase costs. If you're going to increase act or decrease quality, if you're going to increase cost, you're going to decrease access. Uh, and that's a uh, problem for uh, contemporary educational structures. Uh, the other one uh, that, uh, that is important to this presentation is that uh, uh, current institutions are very slow in adapting to uh, changing realities. Um, so, those two ideas are very important to, to understand the idea of, uh, of P2PU. Um, for me, this, this idea, uh, like becoming part of this sort of, uh, I, I, I don't know if I can call it a movement, but becoming part of the idea of P2PU uh, and uh, uh, getting into, like understanding the importance of, uh, of open education is uh, when I started working uh, uh, on uh, a project for United Nations University, uh, the, uh, on the Open Course project for United Nations University. Sorry, it's it's really weird. I can't hear myself, and it's uh, so very sorry if I like repeat myself like five times in a row or something. Uh, but I started working for you and you uh, on the Open Course project, and I uh, I'd written a couple of papers before about like how I thought that information technology could like sort of realize the ideals of the Enlightenment. I was 21, so I was like talking out of my ass in philosophy. Uh, and uh, then I got to know about this project at UNU, uh, the Open Course Our project, where Philip Schmidt, uh, that Philip Schmidt set up, which is currently the uh, uh, the executive director of P P2PU. And what we did is basically uh, UNU is United Nations Uni University Merit. They have all kinds of PhD pro programs. They have all kinds of educational materials paid for by the public, uh, but they are behind closed doors. So you apply for a PhD program, and the content and the educational materials created there, the lectures, they are only for for a couple of people. So what we did is, uh, like, part of the sort of, uh, everybody knows MIT Open Course are, of course, so this is not new, but this is my experience of how, how I got into it. But, uh, so what we did is basically uh, get out the UNU Open Course are materials on the UNU Open Course are site. Um, looks pretty good. Uh, I made, a, like, I put all the content there, I made some sort of sense, some sort of structure in which, which learners could uh, like maybe on their own use these materials and start start using them for their own personal development. Uh, some nice about the lecture uh, units, uh, some some lectures and some audio materials. Uh, but um, basically, what we find out, uh, Google Google Analytics and uh, uh, through uh, our own experience, like that making stuff available uh, is not does not equate learning. Um, uh, and I know that like, I, I know that because uh, the people coming to you in you open course where it's like uh, pay throughs are limited. It's not, no one runs through a whole course by themselves. Like uh, returning visits are very are very low, so it's very difficult to just open up content and expect people to learn by themselves. Um, I was talking to uh, to this guy, uh, Philip, uh, about that for a long time, and uh, he was talking. Uh, he was part of the open coursework consortium, so he was talking about it to loads of people. 
Uh, and then at some point, I think it was in Brazil, a couple of people got together in some weird, uh, in some weird way, and they decided like, what if we just like start some sort of grassroots movement where we harness the power of these open educational materials that everyone has been putting out, and uh, just like have make make people able to to do these courses. So uh, some, somebody coined the term P2PU in that in that group, and it, and it resonated. So. Uh, P2PU stands for peer-to-peer -peer university, if that, if that wasn't clear. Uh, and what peer-to-peer -peer university sort of, uh, how you could see it is like as, a, as, a, as the social wrapper around open educational resources. So the, the initial idea of P2PU is there is all these co this content, there needs to be a social aspect to it. People need to learn with it. So what these people did is they, uh, they, they found some people who wanted to experiment with uh, peer learning and engage with peer learning. These are uh, all the initial uh, course organizers, me with uh, my pre-Berlin hip, hair hip Berlin haircut, uh, and some other people uh, uh, who did a variety of courses ranging from um, economic sociology uh, and uh, creative writing, uh, afforestation and la like land, land degradation and afforestation. So a wide variety of topics, uh, and I, came to do a, a course set up, started by uh, Charles Nesson from, uh, from Harvard Law School, who thought there was value in law, uh, in, in ideas of poker, in the, the practice of law. So that course got started a little bit, it didn't really come off the ground, so I got involved because I played a lot of poker. And uh, well, I just basically put this course together, a course about anything, basically. What PPU was at this time, it was super low tech. Uh, what we had was a wiki, uh, and on that wiki you could put links and you could di direct people who wanted to learn something about what I was teaching uh, to different places. So I made a course outline, six weeks. Uh, we had a chat window, I invited people every week to, uh, to come to the chat. The chat window on the side didn't really work, so we used Skype most of the times or used other kinds of chat, uh, chat windows. Uh, and what we did was, uh, or what I did was basically ask everybody to uh, write blogs about their learning experiences every week uh, in order to uh, uh, for people to be able to show what they what they have learned in that week so what this was was like super low tech uh, using all kinds of uh, uh, resources from from everywhere just to create a course and invite people to learn with you um, but that's not uh, the initial idea of taking these high quality open, uh, this high quality open content. Uh, so, after a while, we uh, like we had some meetings with P2PU, or we had a workshop in uh, in Berlin a couple of years ago, and we talked about what P2PU is, um, and we came together with these course organizers that I that I that I pointed out, uh, and people started to create more courses. I also created another course uh, where I uh, this is the this was the like the old like pretty crappy. Uh, uh, <laughs> platform that we used at that, at that particular moment in time, uh, where I took MIT uh, kitchen chemistry courses and then mashed it up together uh, to create a course in which uh, you didn't have to be an MIT student, uh, which, which had an introduction, like read these things first, so to get sort of up to speed. You probably needed uh, high school chemistry, but I mashed it up to make a course uh, where I invited people to learn this MIT kitchen chemistry with me because I didn't do it myself either uh, and made some sense to it. I could follow it like without without this introductions because I, because I had read that book so made an introduction for these people, mashed it up and created this course. Um, but uh, the really interesting thing that I think that PPU does, well I, I think it's really interesting to open up education. Uh, well, well, no, well I think it's equally equally interesting to open up education to create high quality courses in every sort of field that you can think of. Uh, but there are no for, in PWU there are no restrictions on creating content and what sort what sort of a learning experience you, you create. Uh, so the last course that I created a while, while ago uh, was a course on uh, like drafting my favorite uh, collectible card game. Uh, where I know that there's lo it's it's magic. Where where I know that there's loads of uh, materials out there uh, that can teach you how to like uh, draft a particular strategy or uh, how to play a particular card game really well and just piece together a course on on, on how to like play this particular card game. So that's sort of like that's how I got into PSPU. I got the opportunity to teach 
I got the opportunity to have some peers to, to uh, explore different topics with, uh, to explore different t topics with, uh, and P2PU as an idea. Uh, I'm not talking about any sort of platform right now. P2PU as an idea gave me the opportunity to using outside technology, using uh, like, a, like a crappy platform that could piece together in, a, in, a, in, in little time. Uh, and, and a group of people who are interested in peer learning gave me the opportunity to, to set up these courses and invite people to learn with me. Uh, so uh, for these course organizers, uh, the question is what does P2PU do? Uh, Paul is going to talk about what P2PU does and what P2PU means for, for software developers. Well, there's, there's actually not that clear a disti distinction between software developers and course organizers. Content creators are software developers and software developers are content creators. But you do not have to be a software developer uh, to, to engage in P2PU. That's basically the, 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 the jit of it. Uh, so P2PU um, uh, helps on, the on, on different platforms. It helps uh, course organizers and learners to find ways to, to get recognition for the things that they learn. Uh, you've seen a couple of examples from me which are not really representative, but like think about uh, programming courses which are, which are a bit more uh, conventional uh, as, a, as a topic on, on, in online learning. Um, PWU helps develop ways to, uh, to get people doing these courses to get recognition. For example, and, and, and it ventures out into thinking about uh, very different ways of getting this recognition. So uh, one, one way in which uh, PDPU gets some sort of authority is by partnering up with organizations like Mozilla. So you have the PDPU Mozilla School, uh, Mozilla School of Webcraft, and the courses that you do there are sort of endorsed by Mozilla. Uh, and it means something for the learners, and it means something for people seeing what those learners have learned, uh, that it was endorsed by Mozilla. Uh, another interesting way that PDP uh, uh, gives recognition to people is that the course organizer himself, uh, in this case John Britton from Mashing Up the Open Web, uh, well, his student put up his uh, Mashing Up the Open Web course on his LinkedIn, uh, John recommended it, and he just uh, wrote, yeah, Herman, Herman uh, made an awesome program and he's a, he's a really cool guy, so uh, uh, yeah, this is, uh, he, he actually learned something during P2PU. Uh, at this moment, P2PU is uh, experimenting with uh, the open badge infrastructure. So uh, whenever you do the course structure at P2PU.org right now is a course structure in which you do a set, set of challenges. Uh, and if you do these challenges, you can get badges per challenge. Uh, you can also get... Uh, you can also get uh, community badges for, uh, for doing courses with, uh, with different structures, but the idea is that in the future you can use these badges in an open infrastructure uh, to show what you have learned in places like P2PU. Uh, so basically, uh, P2PU helps in any way possible people who want to create awesome courses about almost anything. So there's a platform, Learnanta, that Paul's going to talk about. Uh, which gives course organizers, people who want to get content out of there, who want to teach people or want to learn uh, uh, fr from teaching these things, an audience to, uh, to make these courses and to get these courses out in the open. Uh, it also provides a community, uh, so you get into the Pizza View community uh, and uh, you come into like an, like an awesome like, group of people who are all interested in peer learning, who are all interested in getting like, education open, ed getting education out into the world. Uh, and one of the most important things that I want to get across is that these people exist. Uh, like, I know how difficult it is to get into like, an organization like P2PU if you do not understand immediately what P2PU is about and how you can get into So there's a lot of people like, behind the scenes and you think this organization is very big and very, uh, I don't know, it's very difficult to get into. But really, everything that it is, P2PU is is a couple of lists, uh, including a developer's list and including a community list, uh, where people just get together and talk about peer learning uh, and uh, develop ways to uh, stimulate peer learning, make peer learning better. Uh, and uh, like course organizers getting together to, uh, to discuss their, uh, their experiences and to, uh, uh, to develop ways to, to, to make this learning, 
to make these peer learning experiences be better for everyone. So uh, that's what P2P U does for course organizers, uh, which is what I am. Like I'm a content creator, uh, but P2P U also helps anyone who wants to actually build stuff at P2P U, uh, and uh, that's why I uh, asked Paul to uh, tell a little bit about that, uh, which is. Uh, Thanks, Niels. All right, so as Niels said, my name is Paul Osman, and I've been involved in some way or another with P2PU for about three years now. Um, my initial involvement was I built the platform that P2PU.org is currently running on. Uh, it's a very basic community site that allows people to you know, show up, create an account, browse groups or courses that they might be interested in, or start one themselves. And this all started from, um, you know, judging from Neil's talk and in the introduction he gave on P2PU, you can probably get a sense that P2PU has been a fairly scrappy organization for most of its existence. Um, you know, it didn't start out with this vision of like, here's exactly what we're going to do and we're going to solve every problem in education this way. It was more like, answering an open question, you know, like there are certain things that we just know are broken with education. So how do we experiment on a hypothesis that online learning happens best when you get people learning together, you know, when you get people engaging in learning activities. So because of this scrappiness, you know, we've never really gone and said, here's the tool we need to build. Here's the software that will actually solve all our problems. Instead, we've been trying things out, look at what works, look at what doesn't, throw out the stuff that doesn't, and constantly try to improve. So I think Niels had a slide, um, a screenshot from a very old version of the website that was running on the Drupal CMS. And you know it served the purposes for the organization at that time. But eventually, it just got to the point where you know working with it was excruciating. And there were a few things that it just could not do. So we built the first version of P2PU.org, uh, which is uh, what I worked on. So when I think about P2PU and the way that we approach software, it's much less like a traditional open source project. You know, you can, yep, sorry. Oh, if, uh, did we lose? Oh, there we are. OK. I can hear myself much more clearly now. Thank you. So because of this approach to, um, to software development at P2PU, I think of the project much less like going and working on something like Ruby on Rails, where you know, it's very clear what problem they're trying to solve. You can show up as a new member of that community, and you will probably be able to get assigned bugs or tickets uh, for things to work on. And that will be your entry point into working on Ruby on Rails or a project of that scope. With P2PU, you can certainly do that. We have lots of bugs. We have lots of features that we need people to work on. But it's also more like an open source learning lab. So the idea is you know, if, you have, if you're involved in the P2PU community and you notice something is missing, you have a hypothesis then. You have some idea about some piece of software that could help online learners. So build it. You know, uh, introduce yourself on the mailing list, say, hey, I'm so-and-so, uh, I'm a developer with this experience, and I want to build this thing. You're going to get some idea of what kind of support you might get for that idea. Um, other people might be enthusiastic. And you know, go ahead and do it, and you'll get the support of the community. You'll get people trying it out. If it fails, if it ends up not being the right tool, so what? You know, like the point is, is that building in and itself is a learning activity. So no one's going to like, you know, tut tut you and say, oh, this guy shouldn't get commit access or this one, you know, this person shouldn't uh, be able to be a part of this project because what they did didn't work. It's the idea is if you can share that experience of what it was like to build a piece of software for P2PU, then that's a really valuable experience for you. That's a really valuable experience for the organization. So I'm going to walk through a few examples of where people have come along to P2PU with that kind of idea. And um, I'm going to point out some places where it's been really successful. The other aspect of you know, us being more like an open source learning lab is that there's not one piece of technology uh, that you have to really excel at to contribute. We have software that's written in, um, we have a Rails project. We have a lot of software that's written in Python that uses the Django um, web application framework. We have stuff that people are doing that uses like CoffeeScript uh, with Backbone.js. It's, you know, it sounds like this chaotic thing, but it totally works because everyone just chooses the tools that they know best, that are best for them, and they just build stuff and it picks up momentum. So 
yeah, that's the, if there's one thing about contributing to P2PU on a technical level that I want you to walk away from this talk with, it's that idea that P2PU is not a top-down project where you have the benevolent dictator for life who kind of dictates what goes on in that project. It is an active community of people who are experimenting with ideas about education and who want to, want to get things that work and want to try things out and want to share experiences. And of course, it probably goes without saying that all our so uh, software is open source. Uh, it would be kind of ridiculous to have an open education resource that's not built on that principle, although they do exist. Uh, we also have a number of resources for people to get started quickly. Um, actually, a great example of the very idea I'm talking about where you try something out and see how it works is we had someone come along recently who was frustrated at having to set up all these different development environments before they could start committing code to any particular project. And you know, how many of you have had that experience where you come across an open source project, you download it or you check out the GitHub repository and then you gotta like set up you know, this huge list of dependencies, maybe you're on OS 10 and it was developed on Ubuntu Linux and it's just such a pain to, to get started. So this guy, Chris, came along and said, look, you know, I really like the project. I want to help out by creating a VirtualBox VM that's managed through Vagrant um, and a set of chef scripts that people can run to get set up with a development environment. So now getting started with P2PU is really as easy as checking out one GitHub repository, running, um, uh, installing a piece of software called Vagrant, and then running a script. And you get a full development environment, and it's pretty great. So the current projects that we have on the go are P2PU.org, which I mentioned is uh, the project that I first got involved with P2PU by building. And it's a um, very basic Python uh, web application that uses the Django web application framework. Uh, and it's sort of like the mothership for P2PU. I'll go into a little detail in a moment, but uh, just to give an overview. More recently, we released um, this mechanical MOOC project. Uh, and this is an application that's written in Rails. So further to my point, the P2PU universe is full of all sorts of different type of tech stacks. Uh, we also have a mentorship application. So this is a web application that allows people to you know, hook up mentors and, and learners. And we have a, a mobile application that someone started developing recently, which I think is great. Uh, no one had actually thought of that. Um, you know, we didn't want to invest time. Nobody stepped up to do like an iPhone app or a native Android app, but this person, Jose, came along and he was like, yeah, I want to build this for you guys, so he did. So P2PU.org is kind of like, you know, the mothership. It's where everybody involved with P2PU probably has an account on this website. And what this allows you to do is browse courses or groups um, that you might be interested in joining or start your own. You know, the whole point of P2PU is that it's peer-based learning. It's not top-down. So if you have something that you'd like to explore, like Niels mentioned, you know, kitchen science or uh, poker from an economics perspective, then start a course on that. So. It's kind of the home base. The other thing that P2PU.org tries to do is aggregate learning activities. Uh, we're trying to really encourage this environment where people, you know, people do learning wherever they do learning. We can't say like, go to this one website and this is where all your educational resources will be. We understand that people do learning all over the web. So as much as we can do to try to aggregate the activities, like if you've created a GitHub repository that should show up somewhere on your profile that, you know, you created uh, this new project or if you've, you know, got a mailing list associated with your project, people should be able to find that really easily by going to your, to your course page. Slightly newer, this uh, was just released recently, is the Mechanical MOOC. Uh, does anyone know what the heck a MOOC is? I'm really surprised. Okay, cool. Uh, I had no idea when I first heard this. Um, so MOOC stands for um, Massive Online Open Course. And the basic idea here is that learning, like I said, doesn't happen in one place. So with mechanicalmooc.org, the purpose of the site is actually to aggregate learning materials from a variety of sources and then send participants emails about um, with sort of a course overview. So the idea is you can get, you know, uh, content from MIT OpenCourseWare. You can have forums and discussions related to a course happening on OpenStudy. Uh, you can have resources that are on p2pu.org. 
and then you can have assignments that are hosted on Codecademy. So we're opening our first course on this, which is called a gentle introduction to Python. Um, that's going to be opening up on October 15th. So if you want to check out, actually that would be a really good introduction if, you haven't, if you're not involved with P2PU uh, and want to learn some Python, it would be kind of fun. So Mechanical MOOC is a Ruby on Rails app. So if we have any Rails hackers uh, who want to contribute, that's, that's an existing project that you can get involved with. Another recent addition to the kind of P2PU universe is the mentorship application. And the story of how this came along is actually kind of cool and, and speaks to my point about P2PU being a more of an online learning lab than a traditional open source project. So this fellow named Alex uh, from New York City, he got involved with P2PU. And you know, he started thinking to himself that peer-based learning is great and you know, learning in these groups or cohorts is really great. But a lot of the learning that he'd done, he had done by seeking people to act as mentors for him. So he's a self-taught developer, um, and you know he'd go out to meetups and he'd meet people who are really good at a specific technology and say, "Hey, can I hack with you on something, or can you teach me something?" And he'd found a lot of success doing this. But there were also a lot of frustrations. It's certainly not for everyone to go out there and find their own mentors. So the whole purpose of the mentorship site is to allow mentors to basically get up there and say, "Look, I I have these skills, and I I enjoy sharing these skills. I'm, I'm I enjoy taking on mentorees." Um, and then other people, to, or the same people, to say, you know, here are things that I want to learn. And the site really focuses on project-based learning. Uh, so the idea is you learn by doing, and you learn by doing with somebody who maybe has a little bit more experience than you. Um, almost like the old, you know, mentorship or apprenticeship model, which I think actually applies to software really well. So I should ask, uh, mentorship.p2pu.org is uh, another Python and Django application. Um, so, again, depending on your favorite flavor of programming language or web framework, another opportunity. There's also an ongoing initiative to create an open API um, for p2pu.org. So the idea here is that as we're getting all of these sort of satellite websites in the p2pu universe, and we have p2pu.org where everybody has accounts, how can we, you know, kind of tie all of this experience together to create a better learning experience for people while recognizing that, you know, learning happens on a variety of different web properties. Um, so one thing I'd personally love to see, and, you know, we haven't, we don't have any concrete plans to do this yet, but it would be a great thing to, to chip in on is like a sign in with P2PU, uh, you know, button that people could click that uses OAuth or something to authenticate you with your P2PU account. Like imagine you could, you know, create, um, sort of a central place where you have an account and you bring back all of your learning materials and notes and whatnot, um, and that can apply to any, you know, you can use that data from any, um, any website in the P2P universe. The guy who's heading this up uh, is a volunteer named Jose, and he's the same guy behind the mobile application. Um, and this is a great example of like tech for just learning's sake. He decided that he wanted to learn PhoneGap, and he was working on this API project. So why not build a mobile application that used the API as a way of finding new use cases for the API, right? It's a fantastic learning experience for him. He's sharing his notes with the community. Uh, he's got a few contributors, and you know he's building some cool stuff. So the resource is that um, if you're interested at all in getting involved on the technical side of P2PU, and uh, you know, obviously I'm biased, but uh, I really encourage people if you're interested in hacking education and in this idea of joining a, you know, a community of people who are just dedicated to testing out new ideas to, to sort of fix things that are broken in education, it's a really friendly community. It's unlike any open source community that I've been a part of. Um, you know, some open source communities are also really friendly, but you always kind of get those like older curmudgeon hackers or something who have very, this is like all people who are really active and interested in learning and just really friendly and inviting. It's, it's a great place to be. So the first thing, if you're interested, that you'll want to check out is, Niels mentioned that we do a lot of organizing through mailing lists. Uh, and lists.p2pu.org has pretty much everything you'd need. Um, in particular, if you're coming from a programming background, you want to check out p2pu-dev is the, uh, the technical development mailing list. 
And if you want to see some of the projects that I mentioned, you can go over to our GitHub page. So uh, we have a GitHub organization, and you know it's pretty easy to get commit access. We're not that uh, you know we're not that uh, big on a specific model of meritocracy or whatnot. But just go to GitHub.com/p2pu, and there's tons of projects there for you to check out. Um, if when you're checking out any of this stuff, actually, if it's while you're here and you want to just see about like getting set up with a de development environment or you have any questions about anything, just come find me or come find Niels. Um, I'd be more than happy to sit down with people and you know get you set up on things or answer any questions that you have. Um, so yeah, I mean, just in conclusion, everything that we build at P2PU is open source. Um, you know, by joining the P2PU community, you're really joining a community of learners. Uh, it's it's a pretty pretty awesome place to be. You're not going to be stuck on any one project, or there's not going to be you know a set number of projects that you can work on. You can certainly contribute to the stuff that we already have going on. But if you have ideas, you know you can pitch them to the community and get feedback right away, and and just do you know learn by doing. Um, yeah, and everything I've talked about is on GitHub. Join the mailing list. It's a lot of fun. So yeah, there's some. Uh, oh, um, if you want to get get involved on the on the content side, so on the course organization side, uh, yeah, please talk to me. Talk to me as well. So uh, that was basically the idea of this talk. Like invite people to uh, to get involved on the content side and get involved on the software development side. Uh, and uh, well, uh, uh, hoping to enthuse you to do that. So if there are any uh, questions, uh, please, yeah. Congratulations for this inspiring speech. Um, I'm really, we are really uh, into this uh, educational space. We are working on a startup based on peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, I would like to know from your experience, how long did it take for you to really um, get a base of users, to get the tipping point, um, and which kind of action points leverage from their user base to really get a massive growth? So, so the question is, uh, what the tipping point is for peer-to-peer -peer learning to, uh, to to start to rise? So, how many users you need to have to have people? How, how long did it take for you to really feel comfortable with a user base, and um, to I know to really feel that you have a community behind, which is creating content, and you you really think that this is getting bigger? Which was the tipping point, and which kind of key action points make yeah, I, you? I think I understand the question. I, I think uh, the answer to that is that the tipping point is uh, that we're teetering on the tipping point. So at a couple of tipping points in uh, or success was measured uh, at different stages, right? So uh, when we had the first uh, iteration of courses, uh, we got a really, after the first workshop and after course organizers started to meet with each other and saw that, that we've actually a created educational experience for a wide variety of people, uh, we, uh, we got super enthused and uh, started to create more courses and got, got into like uh, get, drawing people into the community and making this community bigger. Um, and that sort of uh, created a reaction of, uh, of automatic uh, people automatically being drawn drawn into this community, uh, but we're at a stage right now that that uh, we're sort of thinking that in order for P2PU to really get over that hub and to really start growing and become like a, a true uh, like fast growing peer to peer uh, experience, uh, we need to nurture course organizers more. So actually nurture that community of uh, people creating and uh, and organizing cor courses more. Uh, so the answer to the question is. I do not have the feeling that we, we have passed that, tip, that tipping point. Um, but I do have the feeling that we passed a number of tipping points depending on where you set your expectations in the, in, in the past. Hi. I was wondering where you, um, as you scale, how will you deal with badging the badgers? So how how we deal with it? verifying verifying the badging process? That's very difficult. So this is a problem that yeah a lot of people have thought about and it's it's a really tricky one. Um, we kind of punted and partnered with our. Have, are you is anybody aware of the Mozilla Open Badges pro, uh, protocol? Cool. Okay. So 
Mozilla is doing a lot of work to try to kind of solve this problem, and they're getting pretty close. I, to be honest, I haven't actually kept completely up to date with the current status of the project, but I know a few people who are involved. And the idea is using a lot of the kind of technology that you traditionally see in kind of identity protocols and whatnot to say that, you know, this badge is verified for this user by this issuer, right? Because when you think about a badge, you know, it's really only as good as the issuer. You know, if, if um, Campus Party says you had a badge that you attended Campus Party, that's a pretty good badge. If it's me who gave you a badge that says you attended Campus Party, who the heck am I, right? So it's about authenticating that the verify or that the issuer did actually issue that badge to you as an individual. Um, yeah, so we're following that project quite closely, and we're serving as a kind of you know test partner with Mozilla as they as they make progress on that problem. You have been around for a uh, while, but in the last year or so, uh, MOOCs really have taken off. I'm talking about uh, two startups that uh, spun off from Stanford and also from edX. Uh, do you see them as uh, um, partners in a revolution in education? Do you see them as competition or what's your... Uh, yeah, uh, actually just as partners in opening up education. Uh, is the short answer. Uh, a little bit longer answer is that uh, not too long ago uh, some, something clicked within P2PU that you could see P2PU uh, not so much as, the, as, an, as uh, Paul talked about a lot, a, uh, a completely finished project uh, and we're going to give you, uh, like P2PU is going to give you the education that you need online. Uh, and we're going to provide you with all the right tools to get, the, uh, to get this education, but that P2PU is part of this ecosystem and a place to experiment with these, these types of things. So if these, uh, if these initiatives work, they work and that's great. Uh, so yeah, we're happy with, the, with those, uh, those initiatives. Hi. Thanks for the talk, uh, really interesting. Uh, we have also a group in Spain, in Madrid, about peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, learning. Very close, uh, not, not close, but very small. Um, my question is about how do you see peer-to-peer -peer, uh, peer -peer university in a um, context in which universities are moving into, uh, this, into internet? So, uh, like, new actors are appearing, and some of them are moving in a way that you have been doing faster than them. For example, Khan Academy also, um, peer to peer university. So uh, in, somehow you have like the lab where you can do a, a lot of things that maybe others, bigger ones, are going to copy you. And that gives you also uh, an advantage. And I would like to, to know what, what is, I don't know, comment a bit about, about this. So from a software side, um, I'm really happy to see those things happening because um, you know, if, if organizations like Khan Academy or Code Academy or you know, whoever it is is out there creating learning resources, one of the things that we've really kind of embraced at P2PU since the beginning is that we're not going to host all that content or like, you know, this, there's not going to be one place where you go to get everything that you need to learn about something. So, you know, if we release something into the open source world and somebody else copies us, then they're using it to create great content. You know, that's fine. We'll end up, P2PU being much more about the community is going to end up benefiting from that. You know, so if you run a course where there's really great uh, content available on Khan Academy or on MIT OpenCourseWare or anybody, um, you know, you can, you can facilitate a course on P2PU or in the P2PU community using that content. So. I really see it as just you know widening the ecosystem of open education resources, and if other people have resources that allow them to move faster than us, awesome. That's a problem we don't have to solve then. <laughs> uh, actually, two questions. The first one is: uh, Do you know how many percent of your attendees are finishing a course? Um. Well, that depends on how you define finishing the course. So, okay. But of course, dropout rates within courses or people not finishing a course that uh, is set to take longer 
are uh, as high as anywhere else. Okay. Uh, what? Well, have you thought about any motivational? Uh, I don't know. speech uh, to the to the people dropping out. No, uh, there's the, no. We we identified the problem, uh, and what the uh, what the ideas of these new sort of uh, initiatives starting up. Uh, they 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 are starting. For, for example, the mechanical MOOC uh, is not directly a spin-off of these pro of these problems of of high dropout rates. Uh, but if you, uh, it's the fact is that uh, the model that we that PDPU uses or used in the past where you have one facilitator for a course and uh, he organizes everything, he organizes face-to-face -face interaction and he organizes people to get together and he organizes all the, like getting all the content together. It's very demotivating and I, I know because I taught a couple of courses. If you start a course, uh, 15 people uh, start it and three people, three, uh, three people finish. Um, so the, the dropout rates in online education are very high and I think that uh, with my experience in teaching, with my experience in university, with my experience in in, uh, in in or with my efforts in engaging these people, I I doubt that there was anything wrong with me as a course organizer uh, for those people to drop out. So there's something else going on right th uh, going on right there, and uh, yeah, I think that what P2P is doing is finding solutions not not only by t researching uh, the best ways to learn with your peers. Uh, and draw conclusions for that, and uh, and offer those tools that all offer those conclusions and tools to new cor course organizers, but also experiment with things like mechanical MOOCs, where it's the law of large numbers, where your success is like if you have like 10,000 people joining and you have a one percent success rate, uh, that's like 99 more than, uh, than than 10 and one, right? So, uh, yeah, that's that's basically how PWP handles it. All right, uh, yeah. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. And and again, come talk to us if you want to like uh, get engaged. If you if you uh, uh, and uh, like either in course uh, course creation, content creation, or uh, or software development. Thanks.